Today I want to talk a bit about the morality of private property. Uh, so I'll talk about some philosophical challenges that have been offered to private property and some of the replies. And the hope is that you'll end up with a, a brief overview of some of the philosophical debates surrounding the idea of private property. But before getting to some of the moral issues surrounding private property, we have to get clear on what exactly property is. Uh, and I think one potentially useful way of doing that is by imagining an economy that didn't have any private property. So I'd like to tell you a parable about just such a society. And I should tell you, this really isn't a parable that I'm making up. I'm filling in the details in a particular way, but I'm actually ripping it off more or less from Marx and Engels. And you might recognize these guys as the authors of the Communist Manifesto. And uh, they're quite possibly the most famous critics that private property has ever had. And I should also point out that Marx and Engels don't consider the story that I'm about to tell you to simply be a fiction. They think that something like this, something along these lines, basically gets the history right. Uh, I'm fairly skeptical of that claim myself, but for present purposes, that's not really important. Just think about this as, as a thought experiment, not as actual history. So Engels describes a society where, quote, all quarrels and disputes are settled by the whole of the community affected. There were many more matters to be settled in common than today. The household is maintained by a number of families in common and is communistic. The land belongs to the tribe, and there can't be any poor or needy. The communal household knows its responsibilities toward the old, the sick, and those disabled in war. All are equal and free. So in this sort of society, in this communal society that uh, Engels is describing, no one claims ownership of anything else. So all the resources in this community are held in common. Everything is shared. Uh, this means that everyone has an equal right to drink from the communal stream or swim in the communal lake. They can all sit under whatever tree they like, whenever they like, and no one can stop them. They can enjoy the shade of the trees. They can pick fruit from, their, from, from the tree's branches. Uh, they can hunt the deer and the rabbit and the other sort of game that runs across the communal landscape. And they can do this to their heart's content. It's sort of a, a communist paradise. Uh, so we have what, what sounds like a utopia of sharing and community. But according to Engels, this kind of communal society didn't last very long. He says, the power of this primitive community was broken. It was broken by influences which from the very start appear as a degradation, a fall from the simple moral greatness of the old society. The lowest interests, base greed, brutal appetites, sordid avarice, selfish robbery of the commonwealth, inaugurate the new civilized class society. So all these moral vices came about with the advent of more or less a private property economy, in Engel's view. So we might imagine that one day a troublemaker throws a wrench into the works of this communist utopia. And she makes trouble because she decides that she wants some stuff for herself. So she decides that she'd like to make and keep some pelts for herself. So she just wants these for her own private enjoyment. She wants to have a closet with her own favorite clothes so that she has nice things to wear without worrying that other people will take them and wear them. So in the old communal society, what's mine is yours. So, uh, you might really like this shirt, and you can just walk into my closet and wear it if you'd like. She enjoys picking fruit from the communal garden. That's pretty nice. But she also figures it would be nice to have some fruit and vegetables of her own. Uh, say she really likes tomatoes, and so she wants to be assured of having those in her salad every night. So she builds a little garden for herself. And as much as she enjoys spending time with her fellow tribespeople, she thinks that sleeping in the common housing quarters is getting a bit old. Some of them snore. It's loud. So she decides that she'd like a house of her own. So she gets the bright idea to go out into the communally owned forest, chop down some trees, lash together some logs, and build a house for herself. And she wants a nice little backyard for her garden, so she chops down some more trees and builds a fence around some of the land uh, near her cabin. So basically this woman invents private property. And she's happier now. She has a log cabin that she can live in. She has a backyard. She has a garden. She has clothes for herself. Uh, herself. But her neighbors aren't happy. Uh, in fact, they start to complain rather uh, loudly and vigorously. We could imagine that they even start picketing around her new fence. And they're angry because no one is able to use the things that she's appropriated for her private use. So before, they could walk and hunt and forage wherever they wanted, whenever they wanted. But now they find that their path 
is blocked by her fence. They can't enjoy the shade of the trees that are in her yard because they're blocked out. They can't eat the fruit and vegetables that are growing on her property. And the wood that she chopped down for her house is wood that no one else is able to use for their own purposes. So they accuse her of, quote, base greed, brutal appetites, sordid avarice, and selfish robbery of the commonwealth. And to make matters worse, she claims the right to use force to keep people off of her property. In other words, she wants to forcibly exclude people from using her property. So the neighbors ask a natural question of this woman, and it's the question that I'd like to ask today. What justifies this person's use, uh, this person's right to exclude others from using her property? Now this is a fairy tale, I think, but it has serious moral implications. So under a system of private property, we're all a little bit like this woman. So we claim ownership of things like houses, gardens, uh, land, cars, pens, paper, and so on. And when someone hops our fence and trespasses on our lawn, uh, we think that we can call the police and uh, have them taken off to jail. Or if someone uses a computer without our permission, we think that they're doing uh, something that violates our property rights. So I couldn't just walk up and take one of your books from you right now without your permission. So to privately own something, which uh, most of us do, means that you possess the, forcible, the enforceable right to exclude others from using it. So we can define private property very roughly as the right to exclude. So when you own something privately, when you have private property, that means that no one else is able to use what you own. So it's sort of a, a kingdom of a kind where you have dominion over the private property that you own and other people can't use it without your permission. You can exclude them from using your property. So how is it that we can justify this right to exclude? The most famous answer is given by the philosopher John Locke. And he says, in essence, that you can take private property for yourself only if you leave enough and is good for others. So in your notes, uh, this is uh, what the philosopher Robert knows it called the Lockean proviso. And the Lockean proviso basically says, you can appropriate unowned goods from the commons, so the common stock of resources, only if you leave enough and is good for others. And I think this answer is pretty intuitive as a way of trying to justify private property. So if the inventor of private property that I was talking about earlier could tell her fellow tribes people that they're no worse off for her having private property, then they wouldn't have a right to complain. And the Lockean proviso basically states that you're taking some piece of commonly owned land and making it your own can't make others worse off. So if other people's lives are just as good after you've taken something else as before, then you've done no wrong. You've done them no harm. The problem is it's not clear how this is ever actually possible. So a number of philosophers have argued that private property can't actually be justified along these lines. Uh, so let me quote from a few. So one writes, if the person who appropriates private property for herself must literally leave as much and as good for others who come along later, then no one can come to own anything, for there are only finitely many things in the world so that every taking leaves less for others. Another one writes, the condition that there be enough and is good left for others could not, of course, be literally satisfied by any system of private property rights. Another one says, if the enough and is good clause were a necessary condition on appropriation, it would follow that in these circumstances, the only legitimate course for the inhabitants of the world would be death by starvation, since no appropriation would leave enough and is, uh, and is good in common for others. So this objection to private property looks like it's obviously correct. And it doesn't even look like it's a philosophical objection or an objection from economics. It just looks like it's basic math. So we live in a world of scarce resources. And if I take something for myself, there's less for you. Um, so there's really no way for me to privatize some resource and leave enough and as good for others. So imagine this circle here represents the world or all the, all the stuff in the world that people want to own. Now, suppose I take a very tiny little sliver just for myself. So th this is the stuff that I want to take for myself. Now, however small the, the piece of the pie that I want to take, 
it still diminishes the overall stock of goods for everyone else. So the overall stock that can be owned by other people is diminished by the very amount that I take out for myself. So however small it might be, I'm still harming them in some way because I'm leaving less available for them to use. So in other words, if you take an apple from the apple tree, you'll leave fewer apples for everyone else. So it's not clear how we can justify private property along these lines. But before I get to a more in-depth philosophical discussion, I want to play a little game with you guys. And I'll need six volunteers to start out. And to encourage you to participate, I should let you know that you have the chance at winning real money. Not a whole lot, but some. So I need six volunteers. Any econ students among you? Yeah, I think I need a couple econ students to make this work for sure. So, uh, so raise your hands if you want to volunteer. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so you, 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 and in the back there. Come on up. And I want you to stand around that table. So ideally, we could get you all to squeeze on that one side. That might not be possible. Some of you, if you want to get on the sides here. So imagine that this table is one giant cornfield. Uh, and imagine that these poker chips are ears of corn. So now, you guys can harvest the corn uh, by taking a poker chip off the table. And for every ear of corn that you harvest, I'll give you a real dollar, um, a whole dollar. So I'll pay you a buck each for each ear of corn. Um, <laughs> now you'll have 10 seconds to take however many poker chips uh, from the table as you want. So however much corn from the field as you want. Uh, if there's any left over after the first round, <laughs> if there's any left over, uh, it'll double in the next round. Um, so after the first round, if there are any remaining, uh, you'll get twice as much in the next round. So think of it like you planted the corn and uh, you got more the next harvest. But for this round, everybody has an equal opportunity at all the poker chips. So don't confine yourselves to the one which are immediately in front of you. It's all fair game. Um, so 10 seconds. You can harvest as many as you want. Don't limit yourself to the ones in front of you. And uh, I'll pay you a buck for each one you have. Go. Protectors? No, you, nobody can protect. You all have equal opportunity at all the. <laughs> <laughs> that one's okay. Does it double next time? It does double next yeah, time. What is wrong with you people? <laughs> okay. You chose the little. All right, well, so no second round, but who has. Yeah. Who has a poker chip that I can yeah. reimburse you for. All right. So okay. I'm going to split the okay, what? <laughs> yeah. So here you go. <laughs> One for you. All right. So thank you for uh, illustrating the point very well. Uh, so you, got, you guys can sit down for now. <laughs> okay. But uh, I'll, I'll be asking for your opinion a bit later, so be, be ready. Um, <laughs> Okay, so no second round. Uh, even you, you guys knew it was going to double, right? Yeah. Okay. So there's no second round because there's no corn left. All the poker chips were were taken up. All the corn was eaten. So let's try this game again with some new volunteers. Six more volunteers also have a chance at winning money. How about you? No, 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 you can't repeat volunteer. Uh, you can come up. And I think that's, you want to come up? All right, so this time, 
game's a bit different. So this, the, the setup of this game is the same as the last one in the sense that if there are any poker chips left over in the second round, they'll double. So if there are five poker chips left over in the next round, uh, or after this first round, there will be 10 in the next round. So this game is like the other one, but with one exception. You can't take another person's poker chip. So think about each sort of space in front of your uh, section of the table as your private plot of land. So in other words, you have a private property right in this little bit of territory. You have the right to exclude others from harvesting your corn. So you can only take the poker chip that's right in front of you. If you don't take it after the first round, it'll double in the second round. How many Got rounds it. do we get? What's that? How many rounds do we get? Uh, <laughs> not many, but uh, <laughs> m m more than one. Uh, okay, so go. <laughs> I don't actually have a clock of any sort, but... You can't steal? You cannot, you cannot <laughs> steal. That's the one constraint. Okay, fair enough. Okay, so to make good on my word, I'll have to double the chips because no one decided to harvest their, coin, uh, their corn in the first round. So you all get better yield this time around. Okay, this is actually the last round because I'm, <laughs> I'm a philosophy professor for God's sake. This is, um, okay, so this is the final round. Uh, go for it. I take it they're all gone, okay. Um, all right, well, now I'll pay you two bucks each. All right, thank you. You've uh, done your duty. Thank you. think about these two games. So the first group made a grand total of six bucks. The second group made 12 bucks. But let me ask the members of the, the second group, if I had played a third round, how many of you would take it, would have uh, taken the chips off of the table in the second round? Anybody? Okay, so if I had let the game go on, it would have bled me dry, basically. And so just to reiterate, the members of the first group, let me, let me ask this question to you. Uh, you knew that you would have gotten twice as much money, that would have been t the, the pie would have been twice as large in the second round if you hadn't taken these chips, right? So, and this is addressed to players in the first game. Why didn't you plant any corn? That was my fault. I, I screwed up. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, didn't, I didn't understand completely. Well, how did you screw up? You're a communist? Did, well, did you not take any? No, I took one, and that's, it, that's what kind of screwed everything up. Well, so to the members of that group, how did that screw things up, or wh why did things get screwed up? There's no defense. You can't defend your own property. It becomes a prisoner dilemma. Once the first person starts stealing, you worry that everybody else is going to start stealing. So there's usually a. Like, even if I wanted to make a profit, which I do to stay in the second round, which I don't know why everyone else took their chips, I did. Right. So even if you wanted to, to replant the corn and get more for the second round, you didn't really have an incentive to wait uh, because you knew that if you tried to replant it, if you didn't want to harvest it, then someone else could just come along and take it. In other words, you didn't really have a reward for increasing the productivity. So your best bet was just to take as much from the common stock of corn as quickly as you can. So you didn't have an incentive to wait around and increase the yield of corn. You just wanted to grab it for yourself. Now, this uh, illustrates what's known as the tragedy of the commons.
And the idea is basically that people misuse resources when they're held in the commons, even though it isn't in their collective interest to do so. So in the collective interest of the first group, it would have made sense to uh, wait, not harvest any corn, so then you would get 12 the next round. And this is what happened with the second group. Uh, nobody harvested any, and so they ended up with twice as much. But the first group didn't do that. Uh, all the corn was gone after the first round. Now, in the second game, the amount of corn doubled. And like I said, if I had let the second group go on, I imagine they would have kept uh, producing more and more corn. So they could have kept going until you know, they had more than enough cash for themselves and probably for everybody else in the lecture hall, which is why I had to cut it off after uh, only two rounds. So if I had let the game go on indefinitely, everyone involved in the game would have been better off compared to everyone in the first game. So I think the most anyone got in the first game was two, two dollars maybe. The most that, two, three dollars. The most that anyone could have gotten is six, where they just sort of scoop up all of them. I actually have played this game before and on a piece of poster board and someone just picked up the poster board and scooped them all into his uh, lab. Didn't quite work out as well this time. But the idea is that the most you could have gotten was six. Now, in the second game, you could get an indefinite amount of money as time goes on. And I think that this is what we want out of society. So the game illustrates a principle about how we want to organize our economic system. We want to make the pie bigger for everyone. So if we think of wealth as a pie, we don't just want people cutting out slices for themselves, we want them making it bigger, the way that the second group made the pie bigger. So in other words, we want society to be a positive sum game. Now, who knows what a zero sum game is. So a positive sum game makes the pie bigger. What's a zero sum game? Right, for you to win is for me to lose. Yeah, exactly. So what would, what would be an example of a zero-sum game? Flipping a coin, heads I win, tails you lose. Yeah, that's a good example. Uh, poker is another classic example. There's a pot of money. If I take it, you don't get it. So it's zero-sum. Uh, what's a negative-sum game? I guess the biggest example of a negative-sum game would be nuclear war, where everyone loses. Right. So, the, right, everyone loses, the pie gets smaller for everybody. Uh, I'm sure I'm not the first person to use this example, but I also think Christmas is a negative sum game. And that, that's, I, I might just be a Scrooge, but why, why would Christmas be a negative sum game? Well, if you exclude retailers, everybody else loses. There's a whole lot of profit goes to retailers. You well, so that, right, so, so my thought is that you probably won't get exactly what you want. So chances are someone will get you something that you wouldn't get for yourself. And so if everybody gets slightly worse than they would have picked for themselves, and they have to waste time shopping and writing cards and all that other crap, then uh, everyone loses. Everyone's worse off for, for celebrating Christmas. I, that might not make me popular to take a stand against Christmas. but uh, So the first game that we uh, played was more or less zero sum. So there were six units of corn. And that was it. So if I took two, that, were, that uh, would mean two fewer uh, ears of corn, two fewer poker chips for everyone else. So each person got less than they could have gotten if they played the second game indefinitely. And the second game was positive sum. Like I said, the pie got bigger. The amount of poker chips kept growing and growing well, after two rounds. But it would have had more poker chips than I could have given out. So, What's the key difference between the first game and the second game? So, I mean, no offense to the you know, players in the second game, but I don't think you were smarter or more virtuous. I, I mean, there were a lot of economists in the first one, so that could have skewed it a bit. But assuming that all the players were equally intelligent, equally moral, what was the difference between the first and the second game? So, so I heard incentive structure. How, how can we elaborate on that? So what, how is the incentive structure different? How are the incentives different in the first game and the second game? Uh, in, the set, in the first game, you know, anyone could take any kind of common stock. Anyone could take from uh, a poker chip anywhere on the table where in the second one because you have pretty much any uh, 
something similar to what we consider property rights. Um, it allows somebody to vet their own stock so they can make decisions about the one chip in front of them, at least in the first round, and the two chips in front of them in the second round. Right. Exactly. So in the second round, but not the first, players have the right to exclude. And like I said earlier, that is arguably the, def the definitive feature of private property, that you have the right to exclude other people from using your property. So in the first game, players were at liberty to take whatever they wanted. And in the second game, the players had something like property rights. They had the right to exclude. So they said, this is my territory. You're not allowed to take the poker chips that are in my territory. Uh, David Schmidt, who's a, a, a professor of philosophy and economics, uh, and someone to whom a lot of this analysis is owed, uh, has stressed that property institutions can convert zero-sum games like the first one into positive-sum games like the second one. And the basic idea is that property rights enable producers to capture the benefits of being productive, which encourages them to be productive. So in our second game, if someone was willing uh, to wait to harvest their corn so that they could double the overall production, uh, they would get double the benefit because they could exclude other people from using their, their corn. But in the first game, if someone wanted to wait to harvest the corn, they would get zero benefit because someone else would simply come along and take it. And I think that actually happened. I think one of the participants had the poker chip in front of her and wanted to save it, but someone came along and scooped it up. So the players in the second game didn't have a right to exclude other people from taking their corn. But the right to exclude others from taking their corn is what motivated the players in the second game to make more corn. Now, game one is kind of like Engels' communist utopia, the, the description of society, the earlier society that I was talking about at the start of the talk. Game two is more like a system of private property rights, the very system that Engels criticizes. Uh, but whereas Engels thought that in a, in a communal society, there couldn't be any poor or needy, it seems like that's not the case. So in the first game, in other words, the communal game, it seems like everyone would end up poor in the long run because you had already exhausted um, your stock of corn. There was no corn left after the first round. So at least in that game, it seems like everyone would end up poor and needy in the long run. In the second game, though, everyone got richer and richer. And like I said, uh, it's not exactly like the second group was more virtuous or intelligent. The key difference is that they had different rules. So the rules of the game changed, but the players presumably are more or less the same. And so if you remember, Engels said that the breakdown of this primitive communist society was due to things like greed, brutal appetites, and robbery. But I think these games illustrate that you can be well-meaning, you can be a moral person, and still need this right to exclude that comes with private property. So imagine that the corn game is a real life example. So people just want to have enough food to put, put meals on the table for their families. They're not out to um, hurt anybody else. So individual harvesters would have the option of waiting uh, to harvest their corn and trying to replant it for the next season. But what would actually happen if they did want to wait? What they would want is for more corn to be available uh, later so that they would have more corn left for their children. But what actually would happen is that the corn is just left for the next harvester down the line. And this is what we saw in the first game. So if a harvester wants anything at all, simply to put food on the table to feed his children, he has to act quickly and grab as much corn as he can. That, that's actually the responsible thing to do for his family given those rules. So in the first game, everyone had an incentive to grab as much as possible because if you didn't take the corn, then someone else would. In the second game, people were more productive. They were twice as productive because they didn't have to have this worry. And the reason they didn't have this worry is because they had the right to exclude other people from taking the corn off their property. Now what this suggests is that if we leave resources like corn in the commons, we simply won't leave as much and as good for others. So remember the Lockean proviso that I talked about uh, at the beginning of the session. So this says to justify your acquisition of some private property, you have to leave enough and as good left over for others. But if we leave the corn in the commons, it turns out that we won't leave as much and as good for others. We'll overconsume it so that there's actually less left over for others. So if I had a second group come up after the first game, there wouldn't be any corn for them to have at all. 
So the first group didn't leave uh, enough and it's good leftover for others. So if we care about not worsening the situation of others, we don't want to be playing games like the first one. Uh, at the end of the second game, there was more corn than when we started. So it seems like the lock-in proviso, which seemed to cause trouble for private property, because how in the world could you take something out for yourself and leave as much for others? Well, it turns out that the lock-in proviso doesn't just allow us to privatize resources. It might even require it. And you can see this by looking at the two games. You might think of it this way. The objection uh, to private property that I mentioned earlier basically boils down to the claim that privatizing resources is a zero-sum game. So if I take some for myself, I leave leftover for others. Like I said, it's, it's just a matter of math. It's not even philosophy. But if this were true, if privatizing and appropriating resources were actually a zero-sum game, how is it that modern-day Americans could come to own anything? So I don't know about you guys, but I don't think I've ever appropriated unowned land in my entire life. I don't think I know anyone who actually has. Now, there might be some unowned resources somewhere lurking in the United States, but I'd say those are pretty rare cases, and I'd venture that no one in this room has actually gone out to Oklahoma and homesteaded a plot of land for themselves. If you have, kudos. That'd be pretty cool. Um, but contrast our situation with the original settlers of America, the people who crossed the Bering Strait about 12,000 years ago. They had unlimited opportunity to appropriate unowned resources. So you can think of America back then, from sea to shining sea, was just theirs for the taking. So we don't have very uh, many chances of appropriating completely unowned property, but they had more opportunity than they could have taken advantage of in 10 lifetimes. So is their situation better than ours? So we can appropriate nothing. They could appropriate everything. But was their economic situation something we should be jealous of. What do you think? Just in terms of material well-being. Maybe let me simplify the question. Just from the perspective of material well-being, would you rather be alive today or 12,000 years ago? Who says 12,000 years ago? Who says today? Okay, that's pretty much everyone. So, Maybe in some respects their situation was better. I mean, they didn't have to worry about poor reception if they used the death grip on the iPhone. But uh, I still think that we have things better off than they do. Um, and we can see this by thinking back to the second variation of the poker chip game. So in the first round, there were six poker chips. The second round, there were 12. And if I had let it go on, we can imagine in the third round, there would be 24 poker chips and so on. So the question about whether it's, it's better to be a contemporary American than an original settler of America 12,000 years ago is basically the question of would you rather play the second game in the 100th round or in the first round? So who would rather play the second game in the first round? Who would rather play it in the 100th round? Okay, pretty much everyone. So as it turns out, in the real world, we're basically playing in the 100th round or, or whatever the case may be. Uh, and I think that's, that's part of the reason why we're so rich. So even though I've never appropriated any land in my life, surprise, surprise, I could still do things like own a house and own a car, a computer, an iPod, and so on. And these are things that the original settlers of America probably literally couldn't even dream of owning. Uh, and you know society's pretty wealthy if a philosopher is able to own a, uh, an iPod. So if anything, having a lot of unappropriated land, uh, in other words, playing in the first sort of game, living in this sort of communal society, is a minus rather than a plus. And I should note that privatization is just one response to overcoming the tragedy of the commons. On small scales especially, there can be other alternatives which are effective. For example, in a community where people can monitor each other and make sure that they're not misusing uh, the communal resources and penalize them in some way, say by... Um, say, uh, chastising people who, who misuse the resources or shunning them, you could actually manage communal resources pretty well. So if we played this, the uh, first game again, even though they didn't have property rights, if they made a credible threat to, say, ignore the person who took all the corn for himself in the lunchroom or something like that, that might be a pretty powerful incentive to uh, 
manage the, the poker chips well. But the basic idea is that we have to have some way of providing incentives for people to manage the resources well. And there are different ways of doing this. And there's, there's a lot of interesting work in this area that I can't get into right now, but uh, feel free to bring it up in the Q&A if you're interested. Now I'd like to talk about another moral issue that might arise as a private property economy evolves. So imagine that we have the woman I talked about earlier. She invents private property. She starts a family. She builds a home on a plot of land. She plants her garden. She raises some chickens, etc., etc. The family leaves as much and as good left over for others. So we can imagine that they bring the tomatoes they produce to market to trade with other people, the eggs from their chickens, and so forth. So let's say they, they satisfy the Lockean proviso. Um, and they can honestly say, we've justly acquired our private property. Now suppose one day uh, the family's living happily in its, uh, in its house, um, and one day a tax collector knocks on the door. He's here to collect for a variety of government programs, and he asks for 30% of the family's tomato crop in taxes. Now the family objects to this. They say they've justly acquired their property, they've left as much and as good for others, so they're entitled to use their property as they see fit. The government can't take 30% of their income without their consent. They argue that it's their money, not the government's. Now in this argument, on the argument that this family is making, there's something illegitimate about taxing your income, just as there would be something illegitimate about, say, a computer hacker breaking into your electronic bank account and transferring money out of it. So governments might use your income for noble purposes, but the argument is that taxation is still a violation of your property rights. So hackers might use uh, the money that they transfer out of your account for noble purposes, but they still aren't justified in doing it. So as long as you've acquired your income justly, it's your money, which means that you can exclude other people from using it, including the government. Now, this idea has been criticized uh, recently by um, some philosophers. And the criticism has been gaining support from people both inside and outside academia. And the objection comes from uh, Liam Murphy and Thomas Nagel uh, in their book, The Myth of Ownership. They acknowledge that a lot of people have the intuition that they own their pre-tax income, and they call this view everyday libertarianism. But they argue that everyday libertarianism is mistaken. So the view that you own your pre-tax income is something that they think is mistaken. So the people living on this uh, plot of land uh, in their house who refuse to pay the tax collector are confused in a very basic way, according to this argument. And the reason why is very simple. They wouldn't have their property if it wasn't for the government. So government protection is what allows the family to grow tomatoes with some reasonable assurance that they won't, buy st won't be stolen by criminals. Uh, the government is also what enables them to make improvements on their house uh, with some assurance that it won't be destroyed by vandals and so on. So Murphy and Nagel argued that the system of private property depends essentially on the well-functioning of government. If we didn't have a system of courts, police, and so on, the system of private property would break down because there wouldn't be any way for people to protect their property and exchange it with others. Now the punchline of this argument is that you don't have a moral claim against taxation of income because the government services are required for your income in the first place. Um, in the words of Murphy and Nagel, because individual citizens don't own anything except through laws that are enacted and enforced by the state, they're only entitled to the income they have left after the government has taken its share of taxes. Uh, so they write that the state has a right to demand a cut of the profits of private enterprise for the purpose of redistribution in exchange for its maintenance of the peaceful conditions of cooperation. So you can't complain against taxation because you wouldn't have income if it weren't for government protection. So here's an analogy, I think, that might clarify the argument. Imagine that you work for a car dealership, and you have a good friend who's too poor to buy a car. And you decide to be nice, and you cut him a break, and you give him a huge discount on a car. Uh, he's able to buy the car, but without the huge discount you gave him, he would never have been able to afford the car. So you were directly responsible for his being able to get this car. Now imagine a week later, you decide that you want to borrow your friend's car. He's not around, so you don't ask for his permission. Now he comes back, and he gets mad at you, and he says, look, why didn't you ask me for my permission to use this car? This, this is my car. 
You have to ask me before you want to use it. You might reply in that case, look, you wouldn't even have a car in the first place if it wasn't for me, so you can't complain if I want to use it every now and then. And so this is sort of like what uh, our political institutions are doing. So they don't need to ask for your consent when it comes to taxing your income because they're basically saying, look, you wouldn't have any income if it wasn't for me, so don't complain if I want to use it every now and then. Now, I think that this is a very interesting argument. Uh, and like I said earlier, it's been gaining a lot of steam, so it deserves uh, careful consideration. What I'd like to do very briefly is just look at some possible objections to this argument. And like I said earlier, we can always go into greater depth during the Q&A. So the first thing to notice about this argument is that it's not obvious that government is logically required for a system of private property. We could imagine people simply protecting their property themselves. For example, I might put a fence around my property and have some Rottweilers patrol it in order to protect it. In this case, I wouldn't actually need police or courts to protect my property. But let's, let's leave that aside. Let's grant, let's grant the main claim that government protection is needed to preserve property rights. Even so, it seems like there's something a little bit strange about the structure of this argument. Um, so suppose you're in a serious accident and your kidneys are damaged. You're rushed to a hospital where, you know, to your great uh, relief, there is a virtuoso surgeon on duty, and he's able to save your kidneys. So we can say that the surgeon's work is necessary for the continued existence and well-functioning of your kidneys, just like the government's existence is necessary for the existence and well-functioning of, uh, of your income. Nevertheless, it still seems like you could object if the surgeon demands that he could redistribute your kidneys for his own purposes without your consent, even though his work was necessary for your kidneys in the first place. Uh, Brian Kaplan, uh, who's an economist at George Mason, Mason uh, has also noted that this argument could be reversed. So it seems like if government is to function properly, then the agents of government have to be well fed, they have to be housed, they have to be clothed, they need cars to drive to work, uh, they need gas to put in their cars, and these are goods that are generally provided by the market. So someone could make the case that a well-functioning system of government is just as dependent on private property as a well-functioning system of private property is dependent on government. Uh, lastly, uh, another issue with this argument is it seems like it wouldn't just uh, undermine economic liberty, right, to uh, freely own and trade property. It seems like it could undermine all liberties if we applied it across the board. So it would also undermine things like uh, the right to speak and assemble freely, or the right to practice your religion freely. So suppose there's um, an unpopular religion, and the government protects the rights of the members of that religion to assemble in their church. So the government, say, sets up riot police to prevent protesters from burning down the church. It doesn't seem like this would entitle the state to require members of the religion to spend 30% of their meeting pledging allegiance to the state. Um, and so it's not clear if uh, there's a moral difference between uh, that situation and requiring people to spend 30% of their income on uh, things they don't want in exchange for society's, uh, I'm sorry, the state's protection of their income. So the idea is that this argument wouldn't just pose a problem for the right to own and trade property, it would also pose a problem for all sorts of liberties because it seems like the government's protection is necessary for the protection of virtually all our, our rights, both economic rights and civil rights. And I'll have more to say about this uh, style of argument in my next lecture, this idea that, that civil liberties and economic liberties rise and fall together. Now, uh, to wrap up, I'd like to talk about one final objection to uh, the use of private property as a way of organizing our economic system. The objection says that whatever else private property does, whatever its other uh, benefits or vices may be, it doesn't actually increase freedom. And it seems like this would be a surprising result because many people defend capitalism, free market capitalism, on the grounds that it's a free economic system. And the argument, in a nutshell, is that my use of my property impedes your freedom in a very serious way. And this argument is made by um, a distinguished political philosopher named Jerry Cohen. And he argues that enforcing property rights is just as coercive as robbery. It's just as much an infringement on your freedom as uh, stealing someone's land. And he makes the point with an example. 
Suppose you want to get on a train. You walk on and the conductor stops you and he asks you for a ticket. If you don't have one, he doesn't let you on. And if you continue, if you try to keep going and push your way onto the train, he'll call the police and the police will drag you off to jail. Now Cohen says, in this case, the train conductor is impeding your freedom to use the train. So the conductor's freedom to exclude people from using the train comes at the cost of their freedom to use the train without a ticket. So for the freedom that private property makes possible, the train conductor's freedom to exclude you from using the train without a ticket is counterbalanced by someone else's loss of freedom, so their freedom to ride the train without a ticket. In other words, a private property economy is zero sum in terms of the freedom that it affords. Some people win and some people lose. So by creating new options for one person, we take away options from another. So by allowing the train conductor to stop you, by giving him the freedom to stop you if you don't have a ticket, that infringes on your freedom to use the train without a ticket. So to quote from Cohen, uh, he says, the banal truth is that if the state prevents me from doing something that I want to do, then it places a restriction on my freedom. Incursions against private property, which reduce owners' freedom by transferring rights over resources to non-owners, thereby increases the latter's freedom. So if the state told the train conductor, look, you can't force people off of the train anymore if they don't have tickets, that would increase the freedom of all the people who want to ride the train and don't have tickets but it would decrease the freedom of the train conductor to exclude people. And Cohen points out that the entire system of private property is kind of like this train. So everywhere in a private uh, property economy, having freedom means having tickets. It just so happens that these are special tickets which are green and have dead presidents on them and we happen to call them dollar bills. So you need these tickets, these things called dollar bills, to have access to things other than just trains, uh, you need to have them to access ice cream and uh, cars and t-shirts and, uh, and books and laptops, just about every other material good that there is in a private property economy. So what Cohen is saying is that freedom is basically access to wealth, and he means real wealth, so purchasing power, not, not just the, the green pieces of paper that represent wealth. Real freedom is the power to do what you want, which means real freedom requires having the wealth to ride trains, um, to buy ice cream, to, to purchase t-shirts, and so on. So when the train conductor calls the police to force someone off the train because he doesn't have enough wealth, the conductor is restricting that person's freedom to ride the train. And uh, this might be a, a controversial statement um, in the room, but I think that Cohen is absolutely right. Um, I think that the train conductor does restrict that person's freedom in a very significant way. But simply because the enforcement of rights involves restricting someone's freedom to violate those rights doesn't mean that enforcing rights is actually a zero-sum game. So I think the worry raised by Cohen is very similar to the worries raised by people uh, about the original appropriation of property being a zero-sum game. And so here's an analogy uh, used by uh, David Schmidt. My freedom to drive through a green light comes at the cost of your freedom to drive through a red light. But this doesn't mean that a system of traffic lights is a zero-sum game. So a good system of traffic regulation makes everyone more free to go where they want to go, even those people who currently face red lights. So at first glance, the freedom to use traffic lights is zero-sum. So I get a green light, I get the freedom to use the intersection, but you get a red light, so you have to stop. Now, it's, this looks like it's zero sum, my gain is your loss, but at second glance, it seems pretty obvious that a system of traffic lights is a positive sum game. So the goal of the overall system is to help us get where we need to go. So if we had nothing but green lights all the time, if we had nothing um, but open road and no stops, we would have a lot of traffic accidents, we would have a lot of crashes. And this would mean that a lot of people wouldn't get to where they want to go. So the restrictions on our freedom that red lights create help us coordinate our expectations about other people's behavior. So I can move confidently through a green light because I know that you have that red light. Uh, I know that other people won't be ramming into my car when I have the green light. And this is what gives me the confidence to drive forward and get where I need to go. 
By analogy, if we know that people won't take our produce without compensating us, we can have the confidence to produce more and offer it up in trade. So to think back to Cohen's train example, consider that trains don't grow on trees. So how is it the trains come into existence in the first place? Well, here's a plausible just-so story. Imagine that Jane Doe is living in a private property economy, which means that her local grocer, uh, John Smith, restricts her access to his bread and butter. Uh, in order to get access, he demands some of these green tickets that we call money. Since Jane Doe wants to get that bread and butter, she needs to figure out a way to get some of those tickets that her grocer wants. So she gets the bright idea to build something that people might want to use and then charge them tickets for using it. So she decides to build a train, requires that passenger, passengers give her the tickets in order to get a ride, and then in turn she uses those tickets um, to get some bread and butter. So by allowing Jane Doe to require people to give her those tickets in exchange for letting them ride the train, we encourage her to build the train in the first place. So it's precisely because she can restrict access to the train that she's motivated to build it. She builds the train or plants vegetables or delivers packages or landscapes yards precisely because she wants to get those tickets. So this is a point that I discussed earlier in the context of the Lockean proviso. Uh, if Jane couldn't charge tickets, she might ask why she should expend the time and resources needed to build a train when John Smith can simply use it as often as he likes without offering her anything in return. So Jane might decide that it's not worth it to build the train. And this is like the first game of the uh, poker chip example that we played earlier. So no one bothered planting the corn because someone else was able to harvest, uh, harvest it without compensation. Um, so it seems like restricting people's freedom to use another person's property can actually be justified in terms of an expansion of freedom. So Jane will be motivated to build trains knowing that uh, other people have to trade her something if they want to ride it. So this, this is a system which now allows new options to develop for everyone. So now people aren't worried about working without compensation, so they work to produce goods like train and bread in order to trade with each other. And th these are newly created goods. These are goods that wouldn't exist if it wasn't for the work of people like Jane and John. So Jane's new train motivates gross grocers like John to make more bread and butter so that they can have more green tickets uh, in order to have more tickets to ride or train. So it's a win-win situation. It's a system that, cre that can create more freedom from, for everyone if everything goes well. So Jane now has the freedom to consume John's bread. John now has the freedom to ride Jane's train. And these are freedoms that simply aren't found in nature. They're freedoms that were created by Jane and John's work. And this work was motivated by the desire to get the green tickets, which were so problematic in the first place. So it is true that private property restricts the freedom to access particular goods. But by restricting access to wealth at a particular time, we can create more of it over time. Just as traffic lights restrict our access to the intersection at a particular time, but they enable people to get where they are going more often over time. So if we equate wealth with freedom, then the freedom involved in a system of private property rights doesn't have to be zero sum. So that about wraps up my talk for now. So I'm looking forward to hearing your questions after the breakout session.